The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. Today's topic, international justice and the UN. While the United Nations is often criticized for its human rights performance and the high cost of its judicial initiatives, it has played a critical role in the pursuit of international justice over the last two decades. The concept of the responsibility to protect and the convening of international criminal tribunals reflect a growing willingness to engage in matters of justice across borders. Our guest today has been a frontline practitioner in the promotion of international justice. Ambassador David Sheffer served as the first United States ambassador at large for war crimes issues between 1997 and 2001. His UN portfolio included playing an integral role in talks establishing the International Criminal Court. He currently serves as the Mayor Brown Robert A. Hellman Professor of Law and Director of the Center for International Human Rights at Northwestern University School of Law. His book, All the Missing Souls, A Personal History of the War Crimes Tribunals, will be available in December 2011. Ambassador Sheffer, welcome to International Focus. Thank you, Rob. Very so, pleased to be here. So you, it's, we're really privileged to have you here as someone who's been at the forefront of an amazing uh, uh, period of progress in, in the promotion of international law. And I'm, before we get into uh, the, the formal cross-examination as a fellow lawyer, I can do that, I think, um, uh, of the current situation, but I wonder if you could take us through a bit of, of the progress that's been made in the last 20 years. Well, the last 20 years on both issues, international justice and what we call the responsibility to protect, have truly been a, a revolutionary period in, uh, in our modern history. You know, if you were to ask 20 years ago, uh, let's say in 1991, 1992, uh, is it possible to hold a head of state responsible under international criminal law for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, um, and to do so effectively, um, the answer would have been, well, wait, wait a minute, we, try, we did that at Nuremberg in Tokyo after World War II. That's sort of a historical blip. Uh, we haven't really seen that happen since World War II, so therefore, no. Uh, uh, these individuals, if they're in positions of power uh, to run governments and to run militaries, can essentially get away with it. Now, what might happen is you have a peace deal that sort of sidelines these individuals, but the idea that they would actually face a court of law for their conduct was really still so somewhat uh, alien at that time. In fact, in the first months that we entered the Clinton administration in January and February of 1993, we were dealing in very real-time uh, crisis mode with General Sedros in Haiti. And he was, uh, there was just uh, wreck and havoc uh, all over Haiti. We were cutting a peace deal with him, of which ultimately led, <clears throat> by 1994, to his uh, uh, trip to Panama to live life happily ever after. No court of law. Well, that changed dramatically. By 19, the end of 1993 and into 94, as we were focusing on the Balkans, and then, of course, the Rwandan genocide hit us, for which we bore tremendous responsibility. Um, we, we saw a shift, not only in, in the way we think about these things in the U.S. government, but also internationally, about, wait a minute, um, there is a, a decision tree here. It actually goes up usually to a leadership cadre, and those individuals need to be held to account. Uh, but we need to find a way to do that. So. Uh, that was the origin, then, of these particular war crimes tribunals created by the UN Security Council, the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, the Rwanda War Crimes Tribunal. That, that was the beginning of a, of a journey that has now lasted 20 years and resulted in the, the uh, building of five 
major war crimes tribunals, one of which is permanent, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the others of which are temporary in character because they're dealing with specific situations. But in all of these, there's a particular principle that simply <clears throat> was not embraced prior to the 1990s. You can find it in what's called Article 27 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and it basically says that no, uh, no official capacity, no uh, uh, elevated form of leadership will immunize you from accountability for the commission of atrocity crimes, which is genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Uh, as, as one noted Jordanian diplomat said um, at the time, or back in 2007 uh, when speaking about this, he said, uh, that article and that principle that so many governments would accept that when they sign the treaty, that the highest leaders will not be immune from prosecution, is the largest advancement in law since the Magna Carta. And I think there's some truth to that. It, 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 is it, is it fair to say that, that the shock that the world had after uh, Rwanda, after uh, Kosovo, was something like the, the sense of horror after World War II? That, mm. that, that really two things in your story that, that stand out to me anyway, which is the, the advancement in international law and this, is this principle that you articulated that heads of state cannot be immune, but also the, the, the degree of cooperation between the United States and the UN. Right. Also, so, so we, what we accounts were, for that? We were benefiting, you know, at the end of World War II, uh, the Cold War had not started yet. And so Nuremberg and Tokyo were set up, those military tribunals were set up without yet the heavy hand of the divide in the world between the communist world and, and the free world. Um, we had sort of a similar phenomenon in the 1990s. It was the end of the Cold right. War. And so we were able to talk with the Russians. We were able to, uh, even though it's still a communist government, we were able to talk to the Chinese sort of in a different context now. Um, and we were able to uh, introduce and push things through the Security Council that were of a judicial character, but dealing with threats to international peace and security, which is the jurisdiction of the Security Council. But we said, wait a minute, there are ways to deal with threats to international peace and uh, security, which include the issue of accountability and justice and deterrence of further crimes that create the instability and the threats to peace and security. And um, uh, the horrors of the 1990s um, simply, simply could not be avoided, even if we had wanted to. Remember, the media was all over this. Uh, and uh, the media today would have been even more over it because of twi uh, you know, the social media uh, access these days. But even then, when you come to the Balkans, to the Rwanda, to Kosovo, to Sierra Leone, and what was happening in that civil war, journalists, very brave and courageous journalists, were all over the map. Uh, and they were filing, and the world was witnessing. Um, and so uh, there, was a, there was a tremendous pull on us to react. And it became sort of, you know, it's interesting. People ask this to me so often, and yet, the answer to me sort of seems so simple as to how it happened. I think it just became so implausible to sit here and say, look what's happening in Kosovo. By the way, we will not hold anyone responsible for it. I mean, that, that just, that's a discussion you can't really plausibly have anymore. Um, uh, and, and that was also, it seemed to be the, the, the I mean, the, one of the most astounding things is this, the articulation of the responsibility to protect now, which says it's, yes. it's no longer has to be inter, you don't have to cross an international boundary to invoke these responsibilities. Right. It can be a, 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 a head of state vis-a-vis -vis his own, his or her own citizens. Yes, and, and, and Rob, that's, that of course brings us to that other major phenomenon of the last two decades, which is the responsibility to protect. And the fact that um, it actually is a principle uh, which has a, I think, sort of a devious little uh, objective behind it, which is, by the way, if you want to pay attention to this new principle, which we're all buying into, the responsibility to protect civilian populations from the threat of atrocity crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, if you really buy into that principle, frankly, you can't guide your government in such a way that you commit genocide, crimes against In other words, how can you support that principle and at the same time 
assault your civilian population within your borders. It's an inconsistency. This is a, this is now, a that doesn't, salesman tactic. That, that does, yeah, exactly. That doesn't mean it won't happen. It does happen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it's, it's, uh, this is kind of a slow burn thing in international relations, if I may, on the responsibility to protect. The audience really should know that, you know, in 2005, this was solidified, this principle, by the United Nations General Assembly in a uh, what's called the uh, uh, Outcome Summit document um, that everyone agreed to at the United Nations, including the United States. Um, and it, it memorialized in two paragraphs in that document a principle that Domestically, you need to protect your own people from these atrocity crimes. And secondly, if you don't do it, the international community has a, a pathway to, to deal with the situation in the absence of your in I mean, in the absence of you doing anything. But it has to be through the Security Council that the international community dives in. And um, uh, we, we see that now. Uh, as a, a an emerging and fairly powerful principle, I mean, it will take many more years, um, and I don't think anyone would say necessarily that the responsibility to protect is is deemed a principle of international law, although some argue that now. Um, but the Libya uh, experience of the last year was really our first. Um, uh, sort of runway exposure of this principle of responsibility to protect in the way it was supposed to work. Um, although, if you if you want to draw me out on that, I'll, I can show <laughs> I can tell you what the critics right. of what happened in Libya are saying about this principle. Well, so so we just have a couple minutes before our break, and, and we have more time to mm -hmm. take this up. But but I guess this is the this is the cross examination part of the yeah. the talk. So we have one arc, which is the the the. Um, after the you know, early 90s, after Rwanda, Kosovo, we're seeing this surge in, in, the, in the codification and enforcement mm -hmm. of international law with the tribunals, the war crimes tribunals. We're starting to see, though, a different arc s starting after 2001 and after September 11th. Mm -hmm. There's also this sort of shock moment, both in the United States and around the world, um, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, where law is getting kind of a uh, backseat to yes. to fighting terrorists, which yes. is seen now as the superordinate yes. uh, uh, ex exigent circumstance that that trumps adherence to to mm -hmm. international law, and 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 also we're seeing Darfur happen, where we're saying, hey, it's genocide. On the other hand, the Sudanese government is able to say, you know, you you evade any any sort of mm -hmm. real prosecution. Um, so we have just about a minute left, but could you start us on, on what's changed in that, that second narrative? Well, it's, uh, that second narrative um, actually has had a very paradoxical character because after 9-11, uh, there was a lot of anti-terrorism lawmaking, not only in the United States, but in other countries too, All at, uh, and much of it in response to UN Security Council telling countries, get your act together, fix your laws so that you can go after terrorists. The problem is that uh, many countries took advantage of that to actually create a more repressive society at home using anti-terrorism as the pretext for actually going after human rights and civil rights of their own uh, populace. And we saw this again and again and again throughout the world since 9-11. And I think even if you turn the scope on the United States, we had some real serious problems with some of the laws we adopted in the last 10 years on this issue of, of the due process, the rights of detainees, but also two laws that actually immunized our public officials from any liability for abuse of detainees. Well, David, let's pick this up uh, yeah. right after the break. To our viewers, we'll be back in just a moment on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu.
Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking with Ambassador David Sheffer about international law, international justice, and the UN. Uh, and we were we were zeroing in on the, the sort of the post 9/11 mm -hmm. impact. And you you had you had given us a, a pretty good description of how. Yes, on the one hand, we had uh, lots of laws um, uh, pursuant to a lot of Security Council action against the activities of terrorists, but then those being manipulated to create more repressive societies. So, so if you can kind of continue on that strain as the impact of 9-11 of, of on this progress of international law development. Well, yes, and, and uh, uh, I guess I can, I can simply point to the fact that so much of what uh, has transpired in the so-called war on terror has actually had a significant impact on on the freedoms of individuals within their societies. Um, as I was saying at, at the end of the last uh, segment, um, one of the things that I find most astonishing is the success within our own laws on the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005 and the Military Commissions Act of 2006, whereby not only did the former administration uh, propose it, but also Congress uh, bought into the proposition that there would be uh, immunity for government officials who uh, might be engaged in what we would regard as illegal activity uh, under international law, whether it be torture or uh, in, inhuman abuse of individuals, etc. They actually wrote that into uh, the law. I was testifying in front of Congress a few years ago in front of uh, Senator uh, Richard Durbin's uh, subcommittee on the Judiciary Committee. And um, uh, he took me aback with a question because I was, I was talking about new laws that were coming down the pike that would promote international justice and promote our own ability to pursue individuals who commit genocide, et cetera. And he said, um, but, but what about our immunities? And I, I had to think for a second, and then I thought, oh, oh yes, you know, you're referring to how you guys all legislated immunity for yourselves, you know. And um, it was, it's a, it is, it's a distressing development in American law because, um, you know, we have a very strong legal system. When I was ambassador at large for war crimes issues, I used to speak so proudly of, you know, we know how to do criminal law in the United States. We know how to protect due process rights in the United States. We want to make sure that the courts that we build are, are fair, balanced institutions of law. You know, tough prosecution, but also due process rights for defendants so that you come out with verdicts that are fair. And um, uh, what I found so ironic about the last, uh, you know, the, the years right after 9-11 is that there was so much progress in the war crimes tribunals uh, that we built in the 90s on understanding what torture is, understanding what, uh, 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 you know, disappearance of persons means, understanding all of these crimes against humanity and, what, and understanding the nature of war crimes through the jurisprudence of one decision after another coming out of those tribunals. And it was as if after 9-11 there was a, a vacuum of memory like no one in the administration at that time, the Bush administration, had any memory bank of what had just transpired for years in the war crimes tribunals, that anyone who knows that would say, oh, by the way, you know, this is kind of basic now. You can't really do what you propose you're doing. And by the way, no one else in the world interprets that issue on torture or whatever the way you do. Does that tell you something or not? There didn't seem to be any of that cognizance of what had transpired in such a productive way at the international level to understand what the law should be, how it can be enforced, etc. Is it a tough sell to, to folks who, who say, wait, you know, but wait, 9-11 did in fact change everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, is it a tough sell to say, but look, you know, when we're dealing with, with gangsters, basically, international terrorists or criminals, um, adherence to the rule of law is our best defense versus those who say, well, come on. I mean, if, if someone's got a gun on you, you're going to fight back. You know, you're going you're well, to break the rules. Uh, I, I find it uh, interesting that um, uh, so many of the defendants who have stood before the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, the Rwanda War Crimes Tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, 
uh, and, and the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia now for the Pol Pot atrocities, 1.7 million deaths in Cambodia, and the International Criminal Court and all of the situations before it now of atrocities. Um, a large number of those defendants killed a lot more people than Osama, Obad, uh, Osama bin Laden ever did or anyone in Al-Qaeda. I mean, you talk about the butchers and the really dangerous people, they were put on trial before civilian judges. These were not military courts, these were civilian courts. And they were convicted and, in, and they're serving long, long sentences. Um, and it all happened without there being huge security problems or anything else. Um, so when people argue with me that, oh, this is a terrorist, we have to handle terrorists differently, I say, well, wait a minute. I mean, when, when anti-terrorism laws were being drafted in the 80s and the 90s, these people were regarded as basically uh, pretty nasty thugs, terrorists. I mean, why would you want to give them the honor of being regarded as a warrior? I wouldn't even dream of calling a terrorist a warrior uh, and, and take them under the laws of war. They are thugs. They are evil individuals, and our criminal law is structured to deal with that type of individual. And we should not be intimidated into thinking that our courts cannot deal with international terrorists. Uh, just any more than they deal with, na I mean, our courts deal with national terrorists all the time and deal with them quite effectively. But when you really look at it comparatively, it is the war crimes tribunals that have dealt with the very, very worst of them all and they've done it according to due process of law. How about that? Well, this brings us back to the International Criminal Court, which you, you talked about in, in the beginning. Is the ICC, is it, is it, what, what would its tools be in combating the Osama bin Ladens or well, the, 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 the yeah. others? The, the International Criminal Court does not at this time have jurisdiction over the crime of terrorism. We negotiated that at great length in the 1990s, and in fact, the United States government, and this was my position at the time, I mean, as the negotiator, I actually argued against it. Uh, the Justice Department did not want to go there. There, there are lots of reasons. All this classified information about terrorism and, and the fact that our federal courts are perfectly capable of prosecuting terrorists, as, as our Justice Department colleagues kept telling us. Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually won that battle in the negotiations, and we had a lot of friends with us uh, who also did not want to see terrorism get into this context. Why? Because there are uh, multilateral treaties of anti-terrorism which uh, uh, work on the, on the uh, basic principle. You either prosecute this terrorist in your national courts or you extradite him to a court that will prosecute him. That's the basic principle. And we negotiated those treaties during the 80s and, and the 90s with that principle very much in mind and we wanted it to work. So. Um, uh, I do think it's, it's entirely possible to, you know, construct a framework of prosecuting terrorists that is very consistent with lots of multilateral treaties on anti-terrorism, but also our, our own criminal code is just uh, uh, very, very capable of identifying individuals who are terrorists. And, pro you know, the, the, the nice thing about our criminal code is if you're a terrorist and you decide to hit the Pentagon, like happened on 9-11, Guess what? Under our criminal code, it doesn't matter if you had a purpose or if you were involved, you thought in some struggle and that this is a war and therefore it's a military target and therefore you're justified. That means nothing in a federal criminal court. The fact is you hit the Pentagon. You're going to be prosecuted very successfully for that. You put it in a law of war context and Yes, there's a reason to hit the Pentagon because we're in an armed conflict with the United States. So you don't want to even go there, you know. Uh, David, I just want to shift gears. We've got yeah. just a couple minutes left. And, and uh, uh, the, the title of your book, All the Missing Souls, yes. um, uh, obviously talks about the war, crime, war, war crime tribunals and, and a lot of the underlying legal issues. Mm -hmm. But it also must have an incredible personal yes. impact on you. I don't know if you could just take us, tell us in the last minute or so of our program, sort of what, it, what has this been like for you personally being involved yeah. in these, these horrific uh, engagements. It's uh, it's it's made my my life of memories um, sometimes very difficult. Um, when you go through eight years of res uh, where you have considerable responsibility for policy, 
uh, either yourself or through your superiors, like um, uh, Ambassador and then Secretary of State Albright or President Clinton, um, you 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 uh, you you get hit pretty hard when you're dealing with situations where. For example, on any given day in a particular situation, suddenly 100,000 men are missing. And uh, you're asked, uh, you know, what's happened to these individuals? That happened in Kosovo, uh, where we had launched, you know, the air campaign through NATO uh, in 1999 over skies of Kosovo and Serbia. And um, there, were, there were times there where a lot of Kosovar Albanian men were missing, and we didn't know where they were. So you, you have to deal with that. But I mean, when I say all the missing souls, uh, I, I really do mean the, the millions that have perished in these atrocities. And we didn't get there soon enough to help them. We hope we got to, them, uh, to, to their legacy soon enough to, to actually bring some individuals to justice for the commission of those crimes. Ambassador David Sheffer, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and, and your counsel on, on international law, international justice, and the UN. Um, uh, Ambassador David Sheffer of Northwestern uh, Law School. Um, and to our viewers, thank you very much. We'll see you next week on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website, 